Ladies, gentlemen, and my fellow non-binary gender rebels, today I want to talk to you about Neil Gaiman. And since I don't have any Neil Gaiman books anywhere near me, instead I got Vivi. He's magic. That's it. Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman was a big influence on me. I made a video, however long ago, at some point I made a video, I made two videos, and I wrote an article, about how I was a late reader, how I didn't really get into literature until I was about 16 years old, and then when I was at university I started really getting into comic books, and from comic books you get into the Sandman, and when I was doing my PGCE, which is a year of teacher training, I met a fellow trainee teacher who told me to read more Neil Gaiman and start reading his novels, and that's exactly what I did, so I kind of went from the Sandman comics to other Neil Gaiman comics, which I'll probably do an article and a video on at some point, and then I went into his novels. Neil Gaiman has written a lot of books, and his books are for adults, or for children, or both. A lot of his children's books are actually really accessible to adults too, and you can get a lot out of them even though they are for children. I don't think I would be the voracious reader that I am if I hadn't read a lot of Neil Gaiman books between the ages of 18 and 24-ish. This video has the potential to be intensely long, so I'm just going to cut right into it. I've got 15 books that I want to talk about. This is all of Neil Gaiman's fiction that isn't comic books. I've left out a few things, like he did an adaptation of Hansel and Gretel that I haven't put on this list, so... Uh, mostly this is like his 15 best books for adults or children that are fiction, and I've ranked them. So we'll start from the worst and we'll get to the best. Or at least, you know, my worst to my best. Alright, here we go. Number 15. Oh, I haven't got Vivi. Here's Vivi keep Vivi in the shot. Number 15 is Fortunately the Milk. I remember when this book came out, there was a new Neil Gaiman book coming out and it was being illustrated by Chris Riddell. And so Neil Gaiman and Chris Riddell worked together quite a lot on books, especially children's books, so I picked up Fortunately the Milk. I took it home, I'd had a really bad day at work, which was normal, because I was a teacher and that's what happens. And then I read it and I was like, oh shit, this is like for children children. This is like for like five-year-olds and I didn't really realize. Anyway, Fortunately the Milk, it is a lovely book for children. It tells the story of a guy who is drawn to look exactly like Neil Gaiman and you know he says to his kids hang on I'm just going out for some milk and he pops to the shops and then he ends up getting like kidnapped by a lady scientist stegosaurus in a hot air balloon and he goes to a, a volcano and goes on a whole adventure and it's really lovely isn't it Vivi? It's really lovely. It's a sweet adventure and it's a, it's a great framing device for a fun and weird adventure that this dad obviously just didn't expect and it's completely going over his head and it's fantastical and strange and it's really fun and it's beautifully, beautifully drawn because Chris Riddell's art is always beautifully done. And so it's a good book, but it's still number 15 because... Yeah. <laughs> that was really, that was really terrible. Terrible start, please stick with me. Uh, number 14 is Trigger Warning. I love short story collections. I bang on about this quite a lot. I have a huge soft spot in my heart for short story collections, and Neil Gaiman's short story collections, which I will get to in a bit, were a huge reason for that. His short stories are, like, some of his best work. This is when his imagination is firing on all cylinders. His short stories are impeccable. They really are. Except for Trigger Warning. Trigger Warning is his third and, at the time of recording, latest short story collection. And compared to the other two, Fragile Things and Smoke and Mirrors, Trigger Warning just isn't very good. I can't remember a single story on it. I don't remember it being bad in any way, it just didn't move me. I can distinctly remember picking up a copy in Cardiff, and I was going to get a tattoo, and I was sitting in the tattoo shop. Or maybe Jess was getting a tattoo. Someone was getting a tattoo. I remember just sitting in the tattoo shop reading this book and just really not being moved by any of the stories in it. It's fine, but his other short story collections are way better, and we'll get to them. Number 13 is Anansi Boys. Anansi Boys is one of his most famous works. It's one of his big, chunky books for adults. And it's set within the same universe as American Gods. But Anansi Boys is a little bit shit, in my opinion. It is set partly in Florida, partly in the UK, I think. And it's about this Floridian man called Fat... Fat Charlie? Fat Charlie? Fat something. I think it's Fat Charlie. And it turns out that Fat Charlie's dad was actually the African spider god Anansi. He dies while he's doing karaoke, and then he has Fat Charlie as one son, and then his other son is just called Spider. And the rest of the book is kind of like this battle of wits between the moronic and placid and passive Fat Charlie and his evil, sinister, Loki-esque brother... Spider. I remember it being like six, seven hundred pages of nothing. Yeah, just 
don't don't read that one. Neil Gaiman's books aren't bad. None of them are bad. It's just bad compared to everything else, you know? I, I, did, I wasn't moved by Anansi Boys. I remember it tried to be funny and wasn't. And obviously Neil Gaiman can be funny because we're going to get to Good Omens later. All right, number 12. Again, this is a children's book. Not really for me, but I do appreciate his children's literature and it is set in the Norse mythology world of Vikings. So I like it for that. This is Odd and the Frost Giants, which again was illustrated by Chris Riddell. I'm not sure if the original was. I think it got like a reprint, a redesign, because I think originally it didn't sell very well and then it got redone by Chris Riddell. I think? I might be wrong, I'm not sure, but I feel like that's right. I didn't google it, I didn't do my research. Odd and the Frost Giants is lovely. It's a short children's book set in the world of the Norse Eddas. Is that right? Eddas? Mythology? I don't know shit. It's about this boy called Odd, this scrawny little kid, like Hiccup in How to Train Your Dragon, and he meets a bear, an eagle, and a fox, who turn out to be Thor, who did I say? Yeah, Thor, Odin, and Loki, respectively. And he helps them reclaim Asgard because it's been taken by the Frost Giants, I think. And that's pretty much what happens. And it's, it's a short, lovely children's tale, you know, taking Viking mythology and turning it into something digestible and fun and accessible for children. Lovely story, beautifully illustrated. I had a lot of fun with it. Okay, number 11 might be a controversial one, I'm not sure. Stardust. I saw the film of Stardust before I read the book. I saw the film when I was a teenager. I thought it was fantastic. There was a little bit of homophobia in it, but also that homophobia was directed... well, it's a, it's a throwaway line, if I remember rightly, but there's a character in it who, in the book, has just some name, and in the film he gets renamed as Captain Shakespeare, and he's played by Robert De Niro really well, and he's gay, and all of this is added into the film. So you've got Robert De Niro, brilliant, He's got a better name, brilliant. He's got a better character, personality, brilliant. And he's gay, brilliant. But then there's this one line of, of that's a bit homophobic that I remember that pissed me off, which kind of, you know, then cancels out all of that good stuff. But the film is still better than the book. And again, you shouldn't really compare media, you know, films and books aren't actually in any way comparable, but also I have more fun watching the film, and I find that the book is actually more problematic in some ways. The book is very, very misogynistic, and, and it's not for children, you know, it's a modern fairy tale, but I remember it having this really, really explicit gratuitous sex scene early on. It's set in a little English village called Wall, because uh, they have a wall, and there's this boy, he's our protagonist, I think his name's Tristan, and he falls in love with this girl, and then she rejects him, and so he says, right, I'm gonna go find a falling star, and then a star falls outside of the village, and he goes to fetch and he finds out that the star is actually a girl and then he basically ties her up and drags her back to his village and it's about their journey going back to the village, I think. It's not a very long book, it's short, it was one of his earlier novels and it's not for kids, but it's not very good either in my opinion. I think that the premise is great and I, again, I love the film, I think the film adaptation is lovely, but I remember reading Stardust once and going, nah. Luckily, I, this was like the third or fourth Neil Gaiman book I'd read, so I was already very invested, but it's not brilliant. So that was 15 to 11, and now we're up to like the top 10. Top 10 Neil Gaiman books. Everything from here on is, is pretty good. I don't think I'm gonna have too many negatives about these books. And number 10 is The Sleeper and the Spindle, which I absolutely adore. I was living in Dubai, when this book came out, and I remember going to the Kinokuniya in Dubai and picking it up, and it was just stunning, and I, I was feeling quite homesick at the time, and I was really happy to have something that I associated as, as a very homely thing, a Neil Gaiman book, and it was really nice just having that with me. So I picked it up, and is it? It is, it is drawn by Chris Riddell. Yeah, everything is. So, drawn by Chris Riddell, it is a fairy tale, but I'm pretty sure, as far as I remember, it's not really for kids. If it is for kids, then it's also for adults, and it might not be for kids kids. Sleeper in the Spindle, it takes the mythology and the, the, the fairy tale of a Snow White and Sleeping Beauty and kind of smushes them together. One of them is a princess who needs help and the other is a princess who's going to save her. And it's a lesbian romance, as the cover shows. You know, it's very pro-feminist. It's uh, about female empowerment, written by a white man but best intentions, and I think, as far as I remember, he does a really good job, and it's a really fun thing. I adore retellings of myths. I love retellings of fairy tales. I love things like Where the Wild Ladies Are by Aoko Matsuda, translated by Polly Barton. Things like that, bloody brilliant retelling of a myth slash fairy tale, and it does a great job. And it's gay and it's feminist, so woohoo.
And number nine is The Graveyard Book. The Graveyard Book is, again, it is a children's book, but this is a great example of Neil Gaiman doing children's books that are also perfectly inviting for adults as well. The Graveyard Book is inspired by The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling, who was not a good guy. And Neil Gaiman has, I'm pretty sure I remember listening to a podcast with him where he gets inspired by Rudyard Kipling's works quite a lot, but while also very much admitting Rudyard Kipling wasn't a decent guy product of his time maybe but also no don't like his poetry anyway jungle book blah 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 the graveyard book it starts off with a man called jack who's a, just an anonymous ish murderer who goes into a house and he kills two people while their little baby is sleeping the little baby escapes and it crawls out of the house and it makes its way to the local graveyard parents are dead and the baby gets raised by the local ghouls and ghosts that reside in the graveyard he's raised by um a, like a half vampire and a bunch of ghosts it's really fun it's, it's quite long i think it's like 300 pages so it's a decent size for a children's book but again this is a book for both when i was at university it was uh, adapted by one, one of my favorite professors was in charge of directing a play that was put on by the kids in the year above us and I, I watched it and I thought oh this is great and I was just getting into Neil Gaiman's comics at the time and then this was an adaptation of one of his novels and it did de they did a decent job and then I was like well I gotta go out and read it so like you know another year goes by or whatever and I read it and I thought the graveyard book was really really fun not one of my absolute favorites but there's no downsides to it it's not bad in any way it's a solid, good Neil Gaiman book. And uh, number eight is The Ocean at the End of the Lane. I have a very, very fond memory of picking this book up. I was living in Surrey and I got the train with my housemate. I say housemate, he lived on my sofa. The two of us got a train into London and we went to the Forbidden Planet. That's on Shaftesbury Avenue. And we went in there and we found signed copies and we bought one each and we read pretty much half the book each on the way home on the train and it was just it was a really nice way to spend that evening the ocean at the end of the lane is good i think it's his most recent novel he hasn't actually written a novel in a while but the ocean at the end of the lane is autobiographical to an extent i remember neil gaiman saying that originally it was a short story that he wrote for his wife amanda palmer who i used to be a big fan of and now I've really gone off her. A lot of people don't seem to like her as a person and I never understood why until recently, but anyway, it's not about her. He, she was like away in Australia or something and he wrote the story. He was like, I wrote a short story for her and it's about me because she likes me. And then it turned into a novella and then it turned into a short novel. It's inspired by Neil Gaiman's youth, his time as a child growing up in Sussex, I think Sussex. And it's taking a lot of elements of his youth, you know, as a bookish, introverted kid and his family and his neighborhood and his childhood home and you get a really good sense of that house and the garden and the neighborhood but it's very very surreal and dark as well there's a real darkness to it i remember there's a bit where they get like a nanny i think it's a nanny or a maid or someone who is looking after the kids maybe she's a tutor or something but she turns out to be evil and there's a bit where the protagonist, which is obviously Neil Gaiman, is like running through a field and then he turns and looks to the right and she's floating next to him, grinning with these sharp teeth. I read it, I almost dropped the book. It was so frightening, genuinely terrifying moment. I don't remember all the details of the book because it's been a while since I read it, but I remember that really stuck in my head and a bit where he climbs a drain pipe. And the ocean at the end of the lane, which is in the title, is like this endless ocean that's supposed to be in the garden of three witches that live at the end of his lane. It's a really good book, actually. I remember remember really enjoying it. I should, I should read it again. I guess that's probably why I put it at number eight on the list. Okay, I mentioned before that Neil Gaiman's short stories are awesome. They really, really are. And while it isn't, again, his best short story collection, in my opinion, Fragile Things is a great example of why his short fiction is so damn good. Fragile Things is a wonderful short story collection. And what's most notable about it is two things. One, there is The Monarch of the Glen, which is the final story in the book, if I remember rightly. And it's actually a kind of a sequel-ish to American Gods. So once you read his novel, American Gods, you can then pick up this collection and you can read The Monarch of the Glen, which is set in Scotland. And it has really, really good, pretty long, like a big chunk of the book. And then another thing that you might have heard of, if you're a Neil Gaiman fan, is How to Talk to Girls at Parties, which was a short story that was added to this collection. It's been made into a full feature length film. It's been made into a comic book by the brothers who did Day Tripper. Day Tripper's a really good comic if you haven't read it. It's written and drawn by a brother pair who are from Brazil, I think, Gabriel Barr and Fabio Moon. 
and they adapted this. And I was going to buy the comic, and then I saw that it was enormously overpriced and I didn't bother. But they are still great, and you should read Day Tripper. How to Talk to Girls at Parties is a really, really good short story. That and Monica the Glen is reason enough to pick up this collection. Number six, I kind of agonized over this one a little bit. Number six is Norse mythology. Now, Norse mythology, I read it after I read Joanne Harris's The Gospel of Loki. Big fan of Joanne Harris, big fan of this book. The Gospel of Loki is a book that takes all of the big stories of Norse mythology, especially the ones surrounding Loki, which are all the really good ones, and it takes them and spins them into one narrative. So they become chapters within one cohesive novel told from Loki's point of view. I thought it was a genius novel. I loved it to pieces, a rip roaring adventure. And then Norse mythology came out and I was like, oh, this is basically the Gospel of Loki but a bit pared down and a bit basic and... But actually over time I've come to appreciate it because I have it on my Kindle and I have a hard copy and if ever I just want to read a Norse myth then I can just pick this up. I pick this up and I read one of the stories for, you know, 20 minutes and I have fun. So if you want to read the Norse myths, this is a really great way to do it. And I have to appreciate and give, you know, a big round of applause, thank you, Vivi, to Neil Gaiman for doing this. The fact that we now have a collection of the best stories from Norse mythology accessible in a beautiful, beautiful book written by an author who famously is most influenced by Norse mythology. If you read any of his novels, pretty much, and his comics, the Sandman comics, you'll find Norse mythology woven into the narrative, and you'll find characters from Norse mythology pop up a lot, and so Norse mythology, it made sense for him to write a book like this, and I'm really glad that he did. Number five is Coraline. I fucking love Coraline. I watched the film, I think, I think I watched the film before I read the book, and the film's amazing. It's made by the studio that made Paranormal Norman, which is another favourite of mine, and they also made Kubo and the Two Strings, which is also an amazing, beautiful film, and Coraline was that studio's first film, and I thought it was amazing. It still holds up today. It's a gorgeously stop-motion animated film, and then I read the book, and the book does not disappoint. Again, this is a children's book, but two things. One, it is definitely for adults. I read it, and I was actually quite creeped out when I was reading it, and Neil Gaiman does not really patronise children. His children's books are challenging. He's not afraid to frighten kids a little bit. He's not afraid to make kids entertained, because kids are smarter and stronger than you think they are. And I say this as someone who hates children, but they are. Kids are smart, and kids are strong, and kids are savvy, and Neil Gaiman respects that. So that's one thing, and then, oh no, that's actually both, that's both of the things I was going to say. One, because it doesn't pander to kids, that means that adults can read it and love it. And two, because it doesn't pander to kids, that means that it's a good children's book. Coraline is amazing. It tells the story of a young girl and her parents, they move to a new house, and then their house, the neighbourhood area, is populated by a whole group of really weird people. Coraline's tantruming, she's not happy. She gets lured into a hole in the wall by her other mother. It's this whole other mirror world where a woman who looks like her mum and a man who looks like her dad, both they have buttons for eyes and they're much nicer and friendlier and more devoted and they give her more attention and they're obviously secretly evil but they are trying to lure her to stay in this shadow mirror world where she thinks she'll be happier. Twisted, strange, wonderful, brilliant book, I love it to pieces. It's one of the only children's books that I will read again and again as an adult. I think it's marvellous. Number four is Good Omens. Good Omens was co-written by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. It was originally Neil Gaiman's idea and he reached out to Terry Pratchett to help him write it because he couldn't think of how to keep going and get to an ending. The two of them co-wrote it. The first half is a lot funnier than the second half in my opinion and I once read that actually Neil Gaiman wrote the first half and Terry Pratchett wrote the second half which is weird because Terry Pratchett is known for his comedy writing and Neil Gaiman isn't so much and yet the Neil Gaiman bits are actually really funny bits and they do feel like Terry Pratchett humour so I thought that was really weird. Anyway, Good Omens. It tells the story of a, an angel and a demon, and they've been friends since literally the beginning of everything. The demon is called Crowley, and the angel is called Aziraphale. And the two of them are buddies, definitely gay, never explicitly said that they're gay, but they're totally gay. They are about to watch the end of the world, and they are responsible for helping the end of the world start, and it references, or it literally parodies The Omen, the film The Omen, but it goes wrong. So it's following the omen for the first few chapters, but everything goes wrong and it's hilarious. And then from then on, the two of them kind of have to watch slash interfere with the end of the world. It's hilarious all the way through. Fantastic joke early on about Queen, about how like if you leave a cassette tape long enough in your car, it'll eventually turn into Queen's greatest hits. I remember laughing out loud at that book all the way through. It is hysterical. It is witty. It is clever. And it has a massive cult following. People who like good omens, 
fucking love it. It is an absolute favourite for so many people. For good reason, it really is a fantastic book and it's it's not like Neil Gaiman's other books. And not just because it was co-written by Terry Pratchett, it just isn't. Also the TV series on Amazon Prime is starring David Tennant and Michael Sheen and Michael Sheen is one of my favourite human beings. He's an absolute treasure. Oh, I love him so much. Neil Gaiman was the showrunner for it, so like he had complete creative control and you can tell because it does the book a complete service. It is wonderful. If you haven't watched it, it's definitely worth checking out. Number three is Smoke and Mirrors. Smoke and Mirrors is the best Neil Gaiman short story collection. It is amazing. I love it so, so much. It was the first one that I read. I think it was also the first one that he wrote. There is a very specific art that goes into writing short stories as opposed to novels and novellas. And Neil Gaiman is amazing at it. He's really incredible. A lot of his short stories are very inspired by H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, they're, they're particularly surreal and strange. They're very folktale, fairy tale esque And the best of them are all found in Smoke and Mirrors. There's like three stories that I particularly remember that loving from this. One, one is called Troll Bridge. Another is called Nicholas Was, which is really, like five lines long. Nicholas was, it's a single page and it's a twist on the Santa Claus myth. Oh, it's amazing. It's really, really good stuff. And I remember really enjoying Troll Bridge as well. Anyway, Smoke and Mirrors, like if you have never read Neil Gaiman and you want to be eased into it, just pick up this collection. These stories are just, every one is a masterpiece. Number two is Neverwhere. Neverwhere was actually, I think, Neil Gaiman's first novel. He was obviously already big in the world of comic books and he was a huge global success and a household name at this point, but this was his first First proper novel. And Neverwhere's amazing. You can tell how much it has inspired because you see books and films that are very similar to Neverwhere that have come out in the last 10 years or so. Neverwhere tells the story of this Scottish guy called Richard who ends up living in London and bumping into this girl who's just called Dor. And he ends up saving her life and then the two of them are on the run and they go into this place called London Below, which is this place beneath London where all of the strange, magical, impossible, forgotten people and things live and exist. And I know that it was inspired by the mind the gap thing that they say on the London Underground. The idea that, you know, mind the gap. And if you don't mind the gap, you slip through the gap. Where do you end up? What happens to you next? This book is a chase door and Richard because he got caught up in it. They are being chased by people who are working for someone else. And it's all about this hidden magical society of people and runaways and misfits beneath London. Amazing. Amazing fucking book. I love it to pieces. And number one is American Gods. American Gods is a masterpiece. It is perfect. The premise of American Gods is very, very simple, but that's what makes it so wonderful. Gods are created by people. If you don't have people, you don't have gods. If there's no one left to think and talk about a god or a religion, it vanishes. Gods need people to survive. So, when all of the Europeans were slowly moving over to the Americas, they took their gods with them. But they didn't completely. Some gods got left behind. Some gods got taken over and are now getting replaced or forgotten. What happens to these gods? That's the question. And they're getting replaced by gods like the internet and microwaves. Things that we now worship, the things that we now need and think about and are grateful for. And so these things have gods and the book is about a war that is slowly brewing between the old gods, mostly the Norse gods, and the new gods, the gods of internet and technology and stuff. It's fantastic. His central character is this guy called Shadow who gets released from prison. His wife dies when he gets released from prison and he gets hired by this guy called Mr. Wednesday and it's pretty obvious which god he is. I love American Gods to pieces. Please read it. It's quite big and bulky but it's perfect. It is a perfect novel. It is the best Neil Gaiman novel. Read American Gods. Oh my god, I talk really, really fast. I'm trying to keep this video as short as possible. But me and Vivi, we love Neil Gaiman. We love his books. I'll probably do another video at some point on Neil Gaiman's comics, which is a whole other thing that I'm, again, a big, big fan of. Yeah, Neil Gaiman has really meant a lot to me. I haven't read him that much recently, but every time he brings out a new book, I do read it. I could have talked a lot more about each of these books, especially like the top five or six. I could have talked for an entire video for each of them especially American Gods. I can't tell you how much I love that book. But this video is already too long as it is, and I'm very grateful to you for watching. I think that's it. Subscribe for books.